Joseph Stalin. The Foundations of Leninism. 2. Method. I have already said that between Marx and Engels on the one hand, and Lenin, on the other, there lies a whole period of domination of the opportunism of the Second International. For the sake of exactitude I must add that it is not the formal domination of opportunism I have in mind, but only its actual domination. Formally, the Second International was headed by faithful Marxists, by the Orthodox Kotsky and others. Actually, however, the main work of the Second International followed the line of opportunism. The opportunists adapted themselves to the bourgeois because of their adaptive, petty bourgeois nature, the Orthodox in their turn, adapted themselves to the opportunists in order to preserve unity with them, in the interests of peace within the party. Thus the link between the policy of the bourgeois and the policy of the orthodox was closed, and, as a result, opportunism reigned supreme. This was the period of the relatively peaceful development of capitalism, the pre-war period, so to speak when the catastrophic contradictions of imperialism had not yet became so glaringly evident, when workers' economic strikes and trade unions were developing more or less normally, when election campaigns and parliamentary groups yielded dizzying successes, when legal forms of struggle were lauded to the skies, and when it was thought that capitalism would be killed by legal means in short, when the parties of the Second International were living in clover and had no inclination to think seriously about revolution about the dictatorship of the proletariat, about the revolutionary education of the masses. Instead of an integral revolutionary theory, there were contradictory theoretical postulates and fragments of theory, which were divorced from the actual revolutionary struggle of the masses and had been turned into threadbare dogmas. For the sake of appearances, Marx's theory was mentioned, of course, but only to rob it of its living, revolutionary spirit. Instead of a revolutionary policy, there was flabby philistinism and sordid political bargaining, parliamentary diplomacy and parliamentary scheming. For the sake of appearances, of course, revolutionary resolutions and slogans were adopted, but only to be pigeonholed. Instead of the party being trained and taught correct revolutionary tactics on the basis of its own mistakes, there was a studied evasion of vexed questions, which were glossed over and veiled. For the sake of appearances, of course, there was no objection to talking about vexed questions, but only in order to wind up with some sort of elastic resolution. Such was the physiognomy of the Second International, its methods of work, its arsenal. Meanwhile, a new period of imperialist wars and of revolutionary battles of the proletariat was approaching. The old methods of fighting were proving obviously inadequate and impotent in the face of the omnipotence of finance capital. It became necessary to overhaul the entire activity of the Second International, its entire method of work, and to drive out all Philistinism, narrow-mindedness, political scheming, regency, social chauvinism and social pacifism. It became necessary, to examine the entire arsenal, of the Second International, to throw out all that was rusty and antiquated, to forge new weapons. Without this preliminary work it was useless embarking upon war against capitalism. Without this work the proletariat ran the risk of finding itself inadequately armed, or even completely unarmed, in the future revolutionary battles. The honor of bringing about this general overhauling and general cleansing of the Augean stables of the Second International fell to Leninism. Such were the conditions under which the method of Leninism was born and hammered out. What are the requirements of this method? Firstly, the testing of the theoretical dogmas of the Second International in the crucible of the revolutionary struggle of the masses, in the crucible of living practice that is to say, the restoration of the broken unity between theory and practice, the healing of the rift between them. For only in this way can a truly proletarian party armed with revolutionary theory be created. Secondly, the testing of the policy of the parties of the Second International, not by their slogans and resolutions, which cannot be trusted, but by their deeds, by their actions, for only in this way can the confidence of the proletarian masses be won and deserved. Thirdly, the reorganization of all party work on new revolutionary lines, with a view to training and preparing the masses for the revolutionary struggle, 
for only in this way can the masses be prepared for the proletarian revolution. Fourthly, self-criticism within the proletarian parties, their education and training on the basis of their own mistakes, for only in this way can genuine cadres and genuine leaders of the party be trained. Such is the basis and substance of the method of Leninism. How was this method applied in practice? The opportunists of the Second International have a number of theoretical dogmas to which they always revert as their starting point. Let us take a few of these. First dogma, concerning the conditions for the seizure of power by the proletariat. The opportunists assert that the proletariat cannot and ought not to take power unless it constitutes a majority in the country. No proofs are brought forward, for there are no proofs, either theoretical or practical, that can bear out this absurd thesis. Let us assume that this is so, Lenin replies to the gentlemen of the Second International, but suppose a historical situation has arisen, a war, an agrarian crisis, etc., in which the proletariat, constituting a minority of the population, has an opportunity to rally around itself the vast majority of the laboring masses. Why should it not take power then? Why should the proletariat not take advantage of a favorable international and internal situation to pierce the front of capital and hasten the general denouement? Did not Marx say as far back as the fifties of the last century that things could go splendidly with the proletarian revolution in Germany were it possible to back it by, so to speak, a second edition of the peasant war? See footnote 1. Is it not a generally no fact that in those days the number of proletarians in Germany was relatively smaller than, for example, in Russia in 1917? Has not the practical experience of the Russian proletarian revolution shown that this favorite dogma of the heroes of the Second International is devoid of all vital significance for the proletariat? Is it not clear that the practical experience of the revolutionary struggle of the masses refute and smashes this obsolete dogma? Second dogma, the proletariat cannot retain power if it lacks an adequate number of trained cultural and administrative cadres capable of organizing the administration of the country, these cadres must first be trained under capitalist conditions, and only then can power be taken. Let us assume that this is so, replies Lenin, but why not turn it this way, first take power, create favorable conditions for the development of the proletariat, and then proceed with seven leagues strides to raise the cultural level of the laboring masses and train numerous cadres of leaders and administrators from among the workers. Has not Russian experience shown that the cadres of leaders recruited from the ranks of the workers develop a hundred times more rapidly and effectually under the rule of the proletariat than under the rule of capital? Is it not clear that the practical experience of the revolutionary struggle of the masses ruthlessly smashes this theoretical dogma of the opportunists too? Third dogma, the proletariat cannot accept the method of the political general strike because it is unsound in theory, see Engels's criticism, and dangerous in practice, it may disturb the normal course of economic life in the country, it may deplete the coffers of the trade unions and cannot serve as a substitute for parliamentary forms of struggle, which are the principal form of the class struggle of the proletariat. Very well, reply the Leninists, but, firstly, Engels did not criticize every kind of general strike. He only criticized a certain kind of general strike, namely, the economic general strike advocated by the anarchists, see footnote 2, in place of the political struggle of the proletariat. What has this to do with the method of the political general strike? Secondly, where and by whom has it ever been proved that the parliamentary form of struggle is the principal form of struggle of the proletariat? Does not the history of the revolutionary movement show that the parliamentary struggle is only a school for, and an auxiliary in, organizing the extra-parliamentary struggle of the proletariat? that under capitalism the fundamental problems of the working class movement are solved by force, by the direct struggle of the proletarian masses, their general strike, their uprising? Thirdly, who suggested that the method of the political general strike be substituted for the parliamentary struggle? Where and when have the supporters of the political general strike sought to substitute extra-parliamentary forms of struggle for parliamentary forms? Fourthly, 
Has not the revolution in Russia shown that the political general strike is a highly important school for the proletarian revolution and an indispensable means of mobilizing and organizing the vast masses of the proletariat on the eve of storming the citadels of capitalism? Why then the Philistine lamentations over the disturbance of the normal course of economic life and over the coffers of the trade unions? Is it not clear that the practical experience of the revolutionary struggle smashes this dogma of the opportunists too? And so on and so forth. This is why Lenin said that revolutionary theory is not a dogma, that it assumes final shape only in close connection with the practical activity of a truly mass and truly revolutionary movement, left-wing communism, see footnote 3, for theory must serve practice. For theory must answer the questions raised by practice, what the friends of the people are, see footnote 4, for it must be tested by practical results. As to the political slogans and the political resolutions of the parties of the Second International, it is sufficient to recall the history of the slogan war against war to realize how utterly false and utterly rotten are the political practices of these parties which use pompous revolutionary slogans and resolutions to cloak their anti-revolutionary deeds. We all remember the pompous demonstrations of the Second International at the Bal Congress, see footnote 5, at which it threatened the imperialist with all the horrors of insurrection if they should dare to start a war, and with the menacing slogan war against war. But who does not remember that some time after, on the very eve of the war, the Baal resolution was pigeonholed and the workers were given a new slogan to exterminate each other for the glory of their capitalist fatherlands. Is it not clear that revolutionary slogans and resolutions are not worth a farthing unless backed by deeds? One need only contrast the Leninist policy of transforming the imperialist war into civil war with the treacherous policy of the Second International during the war to understand the utter baseness of the opportunist politicians and the full grandeur of the method of Leninism. I cannot refrain from quoting at this point a passage from Lenin's book The Proletarian Revolution and the Renegade Kotsky, in which Lenin severely castigates an opportunist attempt by the leader of the Second International, K. Kotsky, to judge parties not by their deeds, but by their paper slogans and documents. Kotsky is pursuing a typically petty bourgeois, Philistine policy by pretending that putting forward a slogan alters their position. The entire history of bourgeois democracy refutes this illusion. The bourgeois democrats have always advanced and still advance all sorts of slogans in order to deceive the people. The point is to test their sincerity to compare their words with their deeds, not to be satisfied with idealistic or charlatan phrases, but to get down to class reality, see volume 23, page 377. There is no need to mention the fear the parties of the Second International have of self-criticism, their habit of concealing their mistakes, of glossing over vexed questions, of covering up their shortcomings by a deceptive show of well-being which blunts living thought and prevents the party from deriving revolutionary training from its own mistakes, a habit which was ridiculed and pilloried by Lenin. Here is what Lenin wrote about self-criticism in proletarian parties in his pamphlet Left-Wing Communism. The attitude of a political party towards its own mistakes is one of the most important and surest ways of judging how earnest the party is and how it in practice fulfills its obligation towards its class and the toiling masses. Frankly admitting a mistake, ascertaining the reasons for it, analyzing the circumstances which gave rise to it, and thoroughly discussing the means of correcting it that is the earmark of a serious party, that is the way it should perform its duties. That is the way it should educate and train the class, and then the masses, see volume 25, page 200. Some say that the exposure of its own mistakes and self-criticism are dangerous for the party because they may be used by the enemy against the party of the proletariat. Lenin regarded such objections as trivial and entirely wrong. Here is what he wrote on this subject as far back as 1904, in his pamphlet One Step Forward when our party was still weak and small. They, that is, the opponents of the Marxists, gloat and grimace over our controversies, and, of course, they will try to pick isolated passages from my pamphlet, which deals with the defects and shortcomings of our party, and to use them for their own ends. 
The Russian Social Democrats are already steeled enough in battle not to be perturbed by these pinpricks and to continue. In spite of them, their work of self-criticism and ruthless exposure of their own shortcomings, which will unquestionably and inevitably, be overcome as the working class movement grows. See Volume 6, page 161. Such, in general, are the characteristic features of the method of Leninism. What is contained in Lenin's method was in the main already contained in the teachings of Marx, which, according to Marx himself, were in essence critical and revolutionary. See footnote 6, it is precisely this critical and revolutionary spirit that pervades Lenin's method from beginning to end. But it would be wrong to suppose that Lenin's method is merely the restoration of the method of Marx. As a matter of fact, Lenin's method is not only the restoration of, but also the concretization and further development of the critical and revolutionary method of Marx, of his materialist dialectics. Notes 1. This refers to the statement by Karl Marx in his letter to Frederick Engels of April 16, 1856, see Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, Selected Works, Volume 2, Moscow 1951, page 412. 2. This refers to Frederick Engels's article The Bakunists at Work, C.F. Engels, Die Bakunisten in der Arbeit in der Vokstat, No. 105, 106, and 107, 1873. 3. V.I. Lenin, Left Wing Communism, An Infantile Disorder, C. Works, 4th Russian Edition, Vol. 31, page 9. 4. V.I. Lenin, what the Friends of the People Are and How They Fight the Social Democrats, see Works, 4th Russian Edition, Volume 1, pages 278 to 79. 5. The Baal Congress of the Second International was held on November 24 to 25, 1912. It was convened in connection with the Balkan War and the impending threat of a world war. Only one question was discussed the international situation and joint action against war. The Congress adopted a manifesto calling upon the workers to utilize their proletarian organization and might to wage a revolutionary struggle against the danger of war, to declare war against war. 6. See Karl Marx, preface to the second German edition of the first volume of Capital, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, Selected Works, Volume 1. Moscow 1951, page 414. End of chapter 2